Hey guys, it's Drew here. Welcome to It's About Time. Um, Jared is off tonight, so we have a special guest, my best bud, Christopher Trapani. And tonight we are going to talk about pocket watches. Believe it or not, this hey is where it all started. Here, slide oh. over over here. <clears throat> and we're going to talk about a little bit about pocket watches. Okay, but before we begin, it's always customary to do what's on the wrist. Okay, since it is a vintage feel tonight, I brought out my 1950s Breitling. This one, the story behind this one was, uh, I got it on eBay for a couple hundred dollars. It had a busted uh, face, and I had it repaired by a local watch person, uh, one of my friends named Matt. And for ten bucks, I got the thing up and running. And it only cost me about $285 between the price I paid for the watch and what I got it for <laughs> repaired for. And I got it for quite a steal. I've had it in my collection for quite some time now. But what's unique about this watch is it is a telemeter. Okay, and if you don't know anything about a telemeter, what a telemeter does is it measures the distance and time between light and sound. Therefore, I'll give you a quick little demonstration. If I were to hear lightning, if I were to see lightning, Okay, you would hit the first lever. Okay, and as soon as you heard the, th the thunder, you would hit the lever again. That tells you the distance you are from the lightning strike. So if I were to look at it, based on this, it says a half a mile. So that is, and then you hit the bottom pusher, and it sets it back to zero. That is the interesting thing about telemeters. They are still made today but they were really big back in the 1950s, especially even earlier during the First and Second World War. So that is what's on my wrist. Chris, what is on yours? I have a old vintage Breitling here. Um, and yeah, I really like it a lot. It's very accurate and uh, it's rose gold. I'll uh, take it off so I can show you guys. So This yeah. is a customary Breitling back yeah, in the Breitling. 1950s. They used a lot of rose gold. This one is unique because it has a blue face. This is this was not a painted blue face that was on this. Stainless steel back. And it does have, they all usually have stainless steel backs as well. And it has a custom band along with that. So you have two 1950s Breitlings for our vintage show this evening. Okay, so what we're gonna get into is our topic. And our topic is pocket watches. Okay, pocket watches derived from clocks. In the 1500s clocks were invented okay and what they really had to do is they were so big they had if you see the grandfather clocks and the and the grandmother clocks of today what you usually see is how big they are and the chimes and you have to actually wind them we had to do that back in the day when clocks were first invented and they were a lot bigger even than they are today as the centuries went on into the 1600s and 1700s what evolved from that were pocket watches. Pocket watches were a unique way to tell time, and it was a portable, the first portable way to tell time. So as the next couple hundred years went on, pocket watches became more and more popular. You didn't really have the first wrist watches until the 1800s, so pocket watches were pretty much the dominant feature of telling time. People used to to uh, have them on chains, which we don't have here tonight, but pocket watch chains, they used to have them in a three-piece suit, and they would hold, they would hang down from the pocket, or you would keep them in the pocket. That's why they called them pocket watches, and then take a look at them. What we do have for you tonight are three different examples of pocket watches. And Chris, why don't you tell us about this first pocket watch, how you came to get this one. Sure, yeah, guys. This was my grandmother's pocket watch here. It's actually a... Elgin, here's the front, it's got the blue dials there. And the back is also very unique. If you, I don't know if you can see it, but if you look at the scripting, you can see where it says here, the Elgin Watch Company. I'll zoom out a little bit here. It has a nice movement. Again, this watch, this particular pocket watch, it's gold filled and it was made in 1894. So this watch has a lot of history and it's probably amazing to imagine who would have been wearing, I'm sorry, who would have been carrying this kind of pocket watch 
So, uh, yeah, and it still runs great. It's still very accurate for 1894. So Elgin doesn't always have the best wrap, but this particular Elgin runs really well, and the older Elgins seem to get, the more precise they seem to run. So uh, not a bad pocket watch. No, what's interesting about this pocket watch, and how you can tell pretty much all pocket watches, the year-on pocket watches, is the serial number. If you open up the back which you can with any razor blade or anything else like that, or even with your fingernail on some pocket watches. On the back, you will see the serial number. Okay, the serial number, if you go on any website of serial numbers, there are quite a few of them when you go on Google. And if you notice here, you see the 567, which stands for 5,670,000 and so on. Okay, and usually they ran in the millions. They produced a lot of pocket watches, uh, even though these are pretty intricate for the day, the technology of the day. They still pumped them out, and because this was the age of industrialization, so and that will tell you the year of the pocket watch. As time did go on, you did have more and more companies doing pocket watches. Elgin was one of the first, and one of the first American-made pocket watches that were out there. Okay, I'm talking about the scripting. The scripting, yes, and if you notice, one other thing about this 1894 pocket watch, how you can tell pretty much the age of the pocket watch is basically what it has on the outside. We like to call, this is called Art Deco. If you notice the actual scripting of the pocket watch, the Art Deco feel is this Victorian age scripting. Okay, this is a clear giveaway uh, with the surfacing as well that basically it's from the 1800s and not the 1900s. As the 1900s came into play, you had more and more companies doing pocket watches. And the you saw the Art Deco feel, unfortunately, go away. Okay, It was known as a little bit too womanly to have that Art Deco feel as the time did progress. So what really made watches come into existence, believe it or not, was World War I. And when I say watches, I mean wristwatches. Because pocket watches still were dominant in the early 1900s and into the 19s, uh, leading up to 1920, which was when our second example that we have here was made. Okay, this gets a little tricky. If I were to ask you what brand this pocket watch is, you would have no idea until you opened up the back. And lo and behold, on top, you would see the Omega Watch Company. Okay, well, of course we know Omega is one of the biggest brands out there in the watch industry today. But back in 1920, they were still in their infancy um, trying to get a hold of the watch industry as well. World War I, like I said, really changed the watch industry. Because up until that point, like I said, there were, were wrist watches made in the 1860s up through the early 1900s. But what happened then was they were really only for women. It was a feminine uh, to have a watch on your hand back then. Because the men would always use pocket watches and they would tell it from their pocket because everybody wore a three-piece suit back then. Whereas the women would wear it on their wrist and they can just look at it because they wouldn't have pockets. They were wearing dresses. So I do get it. It does make sense if you think about it historically. Uh, World War I, why the pocket watch all of a sudden became a wristwatch was the trenches, okay? When they were in the trenches, nobody was going to be wearing a three-piece suit. So it got down and dirty down in uh, World War I, and they had to have something to tell time quickly. Therefore, what they used to do is they used to take these old pocket watches, and they used to really, they became smaller, and they used to do a jerry-rig, some type of contraction around it, and put it on your wrist, usually with string or yarn. And that became more and more popular. Well, once this got back after World War I, people didn't want to stop wearing it around their wrist. And fashion slowly became more and more casual. So, pocket watches began to decline. But, they still were made. And... Our third example, as the wristwatch became more and more popular, is another one of Chris's watches. And I'll let him tell you the story on how he got this one. 
This one happens to be a long jeans. All right, guys, so I was in a, a vintage antique shop here looking around, and there was a pocket watch section, and this one stood out to me. It is a long jeans. Uh, the year is around 1960. It's engraved 1960. You can see that the minute hands are a lot more sleeker and sharper as uh, the time progressed. And uh, this here was to uh, J.C. Finnan from a staff accountant from, uh, it must have been his last day, April 4th, 1960. So this gives me a good indication of when the watch was actually manufactured approximately. So, um, yeah, it's a, it's a really great little watch and uh, has a minute hand on it as well. Um, and unfortunately, I was unable to open the back of this particular watch, so I apologize for that. Uh, perhaps on another episode, we can show you guys the back, uh, the movement. And it's actually interesting. One thing we did not mention is when you open the back of some of these watches, um, the jeweler always leaves a scratch mark. So the jeweler usually will uh, do that so that you're aware that he uh, or she was the jeweler to service that watch. So That is uh, correct. He, Chris is absolutely right. Jewelers would only know the watch was serviced if their initials were engraved in the back of the watch. So if you had three or four different initials, they'd know it was serviced three or four different times. Therefore, they knew exactly what to replace. And another thing you'd have to know about pocket watches is usually the watch and the watch case did not come together. Usually they were made at different times, which is why you would see different serial numbers on the watch case and on the watch itself. If these, none of these really have actual outer cases. These are really just the watch. But normally they had protection cases, which you would open up and then you would view the, the wristwatch. So that you would see as different dates with different serial numbers as well. So don't be uh, really alarmed if you ever get a pocket watch and you see different serial numbers. That's why that is the case. So as pocket watches did progress throughout the decades, they did diminish. Um, believe it or not, like uh, Chris was saying, the, this was probably the latest type of design in the 1950s, 1960s. It does have the sub-second dial as well. They did become more and more accurate along with watches along the way. But as the watch industry progressed, pocket watches were in decline. People weren't wearing three-piece suits anymore. Uh, you rarely ever see them today outside of Jared. So basically, um, he is an old throwback, which his suit would have gone very well with this episode. But he's not here today. So... We're just going to basically wrap this up. What happened with pocket watches, where they made a steep decline, even though all companies still do make them, believe it or not, but they're usually now more, as Chris's example was, for retirements, for anniversaries, for special occasions. It wasn't fashionable, as it is isn't today, to wear a pocket watch, because it isn't really practical. Not when you have smart watches and you have regular watches still dominating the industry, both digital and analog. So... They did get a little resurgence uh, back at, in around 2000 when they became a steampunk uh, revolutionary culture. Uh, the emo um, type of uh, teen brought them back because they did like to wear them in their jeans and outside of their clothes as well. But they are pretty much a rarity today. They are an antique and a collector's item more than anything. And you might see them every now and then, like I said, for a retirement or an anniversary um, that's given to somebody, especially if it's made of 14 karat or 10 karat gold, because that does carry value. Anytime anything's made out of gold, it's a jewelry piece. And uh, usually today, if you want to find the best pocket watches, Chris, where should they look? Probably eBay would be a good start. Uh, you could also check out any antique shops. Uh, locally and just do some digging you know you might have to go to a couple different antique shops but eventually you're gonna hit gold for instance this uh, Longines pocket watch I got it for maybe 50 bucks and uh, the person who sold to me didn't even realize it was gold filled so uh, and this watch is probably worth a little more than fifty dollars so and uh, Drew what would you say uh, to a beginner who's starting to just starting out collecting pocket watches what are the top five watch brands you would say for a pocket watch that is a good quality pocket watch that is going to uh, increase in value as time progresses? That's a good question, Chris. One of the ones I do recommend, if you can find an Omega, especially back from the early 1900s, uh, they are always very collectible. Um, believe it or not, we don't have this example here tonight, uh, Hoyer 
was big in the pocket watch brand, and they were big in the stopwatch industry as well. Stopwatches and pocket watches did go hand in hand. So if Hoyer, I uh, wish we had that example here tonight, um, was a great brand to collect before it became Tag Hoyer. As soon as it became Tag Hoyer, it went to hell. But before it became Tag Hoyer, it was actually a very reputable brand. You, which, might get, you might get some comments on YouTube for that statement. That's fine. I've been dealing with them ever since. So it's not... If you looked in, I think, episode three or four, it was under one of my five worst watch brands you could buy out there today. But back in the day, Hoyer was actually a very, very good, accurate brand because they were known for their stop watches and their pocket watches. Another brand, like Chris has here, is Longines. Very good to collect. A nice collector's piece. They were around, they've been around for over 100 years, and they are known for aviation as well as the pilot watches, such as Breitling, which is another one that I would collect if I could get my hands on a Breitling pocket watch. I definitely would, also going by the name Secura. Uh, and finally, if you can find one, which are really rare, I always go with Rolex. Um, not really known for their pocket watches because all you see today is their wrist watches. But if you could get a pocket watch of theirs, I would highly recommend it. They always increase in value. So that pretty much wraps up the history of pocket watches and our show today. I want you guys to stay tuned for future episodes that we will, we will have. Jared will be back with me on Tuesday as him and I will discuss how to know if you got a good deal on your watch or not. If you took a bath or if you got a steal. You won't want to miss that episode as well as future episodes that we're going to have later on down on the Jersey Shore. We're going to be visiting some places such as LBI where we will do some episodes down there for you as well. Thank you very much for liking our last video in Atlantic City that now has over 2,000 likes or 2,000 watches on it I should say. Uh, we do plan to do more of those special episodes as the season progresses. So, Chris, I'd like to thank you today for taking Jared's spot. And thank you for me. having me. It was a pleasure. And we'd like to thank you always. Please like our videos, watch them. Comment. Comment. Give us your comments. We're, we will have a Q&A session later on in the season as well. And if you have any suggestions for uh, topics that we perhaps did not cover, that Drew and Jared did not cover, feel free to send a comment and maybe they will... Uh, be able to do something. We're always up for suggestions and we will take those topics in mind and use them for future episodes. Thank you very much once again for joining us here at It's About Time. Take and care, guys. we will see you next time.